I've been thinking a lot about Emily Hobhouse lately, the British welfare activist who, in 1901, denounced the British Army for their treatment of enemy civilians at war. Hobhouse was the first civilian to decry the British government for creating the world's first concentration camps during the Second Boer War, and was the central figure in bringing aid and assistance to her country's enemies, the captured Boer women and children. Lord Kitchener, the British commander-in-chief during the war, referred to Hop House as that bloody woman. When attempting to visit South Africa a second time, Kitchener deported her back to England with no reason given. In our current times of war, I think it's important to remember the story of people like Emily Hophouse, who stood up against violence, who stood for peace, and who led the cause for mercy and justice for one's enemies. Hophouse was part of a broad anti-war movement of the period, the kind of movement that is desperately needed today. This is the world according to Emily Hophouse. The Boer War began in 1899 as a conflict between the British Empire and the two Boer Republics. The Boers were descendants of Dutch settlers and had, over time, largely been pushed inland to settle farming and grazing areas away from the Cape Colony. When the Second War began, the Boers were lightly trained and were quickly overwhelmed by the superior British army, who occupied much of their territory. However, the Boers turned quickly to guerrilla warfare, and there they proved formidable. Lord Kitchener, facing a protracted conflict and reputational damage back home in England, instigated a brutal scorched earth policy. British soldiers were given orders to set fire to Boer land, farms and crops, and to take women and children captive and place them in newly built concentration camps. The camps had inhumane living conditions. Poverty, pestilence and disease were rampant, and soon the camps became synonymous with death. Emily Hophouse was one of the first British civilians who objected to them. Her story is often swept aside in the history books, seen as a footnote beside her more luminous male peers, including her brother, Leonard Trelawney Hophouse, a famous peace theorist, and her close friend, Mahatma Gandhi. But Emily's story is equally worth telling, if for no other reason than that she was an unusual candidate for a peace activist. She grew up in Cornwall and had a sheltered life as the daughter of an archdeacon. In 1900, a Liberal Member of Parliament, Leonard Courtney, invited Hophouse to become secretary of the Women's Branch of the South African Reconciliation Committee, an anti-war organisation. It was there that she first learned of the concentration camps. Women and children, she was told, had been captured and were forced to live in crippling conditions. Hophouse responded immediately by establishing the Distress Fund for South African women and children. She raised money among the British elite and aristocracy, liberal sympathisers, sympathisers and pacifists, who were a much stronger political force at the time. She then set off to South Africa to put the money to good use. What she found there was far worse than she had feared. Expecting to find only one camp, she found several, and all in a horrific state of overcrowding, disease and malnutrition from a lack of food and resources. Hophouse kept a diary and reported her findings. What follows is a partial extract from that diary. She wrote... In some camps, two and even three sets of people occupy one tent, and ten and even twelve persons are frequently herded together in tents of which the cubic capacity is about 500. I call this camp system a wholesale cruelty. To keep these camps going is murder to the children. 
It can never be wiped out of the memories of the people. It presses hardest on the children. They droop in the terrible heat and with the insufficient, unsuitable food. Whatever you do, whatever the authorities do, and they are, I believe, doing their best with very limited means, it is all only a miserable patch on a great ill. Thousands, physically unfit, are placed in conditions of life which they have not strength to endure. In front of them is blank ruin. If only the English people would try to exercise a little imagination, picture the whole miserable scene, entire villages rooted up and dumped in a strange, bare place. The women are wonderful. They cry very little and never complain. The very magnitude of their sufferings, their indignities, loss and anxiety seems to lift them beyond tears. Only when it cuts afresh at them, through their children, do their feelings flash out. Some people in town still assert that the camp is a haven of bliss. I was at the camp today, and just in one little corner, this is the sort of thing I found. The nurse, underfed and overworked, just sinking onto her bed, hardly able to hold herself up, after coping with some thirty typhoid and other patients, with only the untrained help of two poor girls, cooking as well as nursing to do herself. Next tent, a six-month-old baby gasping its life out on its mother's knee, two or three others drooping sick in that tent. Next, a girl of 21 laying, dying on a stretcher, the father a big, gentle boy kneeling beside her, while next, his wife was watching a child of six also dying, and one of about five drooping. Already this couple had lost three children in the hospital, and so would not let these go, though I begged hard to take them out of the hot tent. I can't describe what it is to see these children lying about in a state of collapse. It's just exactly like faded flowers thrown away, and one has to stand and look on at such misery and be able to do almost nothing. It is such a curious position, hollow and rotten to the heart's core, to have made large and comfortable communities of people whom you call refugees and say you are protecting, but who call themselves prisoners of war, compulsorily detained and detesting your protection. When Emily Hophouse returned to England, she received fierce criticism from the British government. It was then that Lord Kitchener referred to her as that bloody woman for interfering in government affairs. Despite fierce government criticism, she kept on maintaining her cause and spreading news of the camps and gaining sympathy among the general public. She eventually convinced the government to establish the Fawcett Commission to review the conditions in the camps, and the commission largely corroborated her original findings. But when Emily tried to return to Cape Town in 1901, Lord Kitchener had her deported, with no reason given. Despite her successful public advocacy, tensions between her and the authorities remained. Although conditions in the camps began to improve, it was already too late. Over 26,000 women and children died in the camps during the war. Those who lived were set free but had to swear allegiance to the British crown. Years later, in 1913, Emily Hophouse returned to South Africa, and it was there that she met Mahatma Gandhi, and they became lifelong friends. Hophouse was influential in her ideas about peace on Gandhi's eventual strategy of peaceful, non-violent civil disobedience in India otherwise known as the philosophy of Satyagraha. Satyagraha, as Gandhi explained it, is a weapon of the strong. It admits no violence under any circumstances whatsoever, and it ever insists upon truth. The weapon of the pacifist was not a gun, but disobedience, the use of one's own body, hunger strikes, protests, and marches. All were extremely successful when used by Gandhi in his campaign to free India from British rule. Hobhouse and Gandhi both opposed 
the First World War, and in their respective ways protested vigorously against it. They remained dedicated to the cause of pacifism, and throughout their lives struggled to end violence and conflict. In 1923, Emily Hobhouse wrote of this continuing struggle, and the need for politicians to join her. It is astonishing that though so long a list of the world's greatest thinkers in all periods have pronounced against war, yet to this day no statesman has appeared capable of abolishing it as a means of settling disputes. Great, therefore, will be the statesman who takes his stand on permanent peace. He will teach the world that peace is not a mere absence of war, that it is not a passive do-nothing existence, but rather an agreement to join together in work of mutual interest, cooperation in place of competition. Histories should be rewritten, showing how mistaken statesmen have invariably been in leading their countrymen into war, and how little is gained and at what enormous cost. The attention of youth should be fixed on the really great thinkers, poets, discoverers, scientists, etc., who have laboured to advance history, not destroy. Given the current state of the world, it is good to consider the examples of Hophouse and Gandhi as shining lights in a world still struggling against the darkness of conflict and brutality. Thanks for watching my videos. Feel free to like and subscribe to the channel and comment below to share your thoughts.